Illinois. Mine's a Cape Cod. I know Santi had one listed for 350, like two blocks over. Yeah. His was a rancher, but it was similar in square footage. His is active under contract at 379. Mm. Right? Yeah. So I figured 350 would be good. So the house next to her went on the market for 75K less, but that house doesn't have central air, doesn't have a basement, doesn't have two bedrooms in one bath, it just has three and two baths. Yeah. She's got a two car attached garage, that would help her. Yeah. So it so brings it back up to that. Yeah, you know, yeah, easily. for sure. And then the one at the end of the street, so listed at 375, which I think again, that one's a little high. Yeah. Because it's, it's, in my opinion, it's more for an investor because it's split into two efficiencies. Okay. You can't get to the upstairs from the inside of the house. You have to use the steps outside. Oh, huh. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, at 375, even if you're an investor, like it's still a healthy payment. Yeah. At 375. Yeah. Upstairs, just looking at it, it looks like it's a kitchen, a bedroom, and oh, a bathroom. Sure. Hmm. Same style house. So it doesn't yeah. have much more room upstairs. Interesting. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's the hard part is it's it's kind of hit or miss. It's not necessarily all properties it's a lot of properties um i mean the, i guess the thing for me is that i work with a lot of buyers and i'll see you know that it's in a shittier condition yeah that have had multiple offers in less time yeah yeah you know what i mean yeah like this house has a the roof is just put on it with a big carol from 2000 hmm. Yeah. How long, on average, the other properties that have been in there? How long have they been on the market? Recent sales. Yeah. I mean, I would take a look at that. Um, I mean, it could be anything from school district to if it's a busy. Is it a busy street? Yeah. What neighborhood is it in? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's definitely an odd market in that it's there's no rule of thumb. There's no straight across the board. This is what every seller can expect. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason as to why some are going for uh, multiple offers in a matter of days or hours and others are on for a week or two. Um, you know, Nubia was just telling me she has one that's in Montgomery County. It's uh, priced at eight ninety nine, and within four days they had two offers, escalations, bidding wars, appraisal guarantees, or appraisal waivers. So it's I can't even really say that it's you know houses in the lower price points. We're seeing it in houses even in the higher price points too, because there's just not as many of them. Um, it'll be interesting to see what spring market brings. I think part of the problem that's clogging up our listing inventory right now is the fact that buyers know that one, when they go to, when they want to buy, they're going to pay more than what they might want to pay. So they're, they're going to, they feel like they're going to overpay. I'll just grab one of each if you want. Um, hi. And then also this worry that they're not going to even find something to buy, that they're not going to be able to get under contract once they do find something to buy. So um, that's kind of, oh, I think somebody missed page two. That's page two. There's, it's a two page. That might've been Carolyn. I missed page two. Um, so yeah, so you have buy, you have peace, homes, homeowners, that would be sellers and would be putting properties on the market, right? And opening up some inventory. But their concern is, well, that's fine. If I sell, where am I going to go? And I don't know where I'm going to live. I'm going to overpay for whatever I buy. So it's kind of this, you get stuck in this yeah. spiral, right? This um, catch 22. And that's really what's holding up inventory opening up. Yeah. I ran her a net sheet and I was like, you know, because, you know, when I was doing the paperwork for the, um, you know, what she owed on the house, mm -hmm. and I saw the number, and I was like, that was backwards, because 
that Keith did the deal for. Yeah. What she bought. Yeah. And I was looking at that and I was, you know, I'm like, not be better than it, but I thought you, but she got like a huge bonus from you. Hi. For, you know, either realisting or doing whatever she did, she got a huge bonus. And she was going to use that on to put down the house. Hmm. And Keith kind of told her, don't, don't do that. You know, you're fine where you're at, it's going to be, you know, going to be more. Yeah. Basically. So you know, interesting. She's only been there for a couple of years. She's going to net, you know, with no seller help, thirty-one thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, so I ran the net sheet for her, and I said, "Listen, we're going to offer a up front, like we'll put that out there. Hey, right, you know, advertise <clears> it. Yeah." And she was like, "You know." I'm going to negotiate that when the offers come in. She said, you know, we'll let it go for like another week and then, you know, we'll read it. Yeah. Time. And that's the thing. So the thing to keep in mind is sellers need to not, and, and well, agents, I feel like agents are, are instilling this sense of urgency or this doom and gloom in sellers that if they don't get multiple offers in the first week, then, oh, it's terrible. Something's wrong. Yeah, because we've gotten well, yeah, we're yeah. spoiled by this crazy market. That's a more normal market. That's a healthier scenario, a healthier situation, especially for buyers. So I would try to keep them, you know, prepare them for, listen, there's a couple ways that this could go. It's not necessarily going to be multiple offers, bidding wars, escalation, et cetera, unless you really feel like by looking at the past comps and what's sold in the market, that that's how it's going to be. Also price drives that feeding frenzy. So if we kind of jump in, so I want to start from the seller's perspective and a listing perspective, listing agent perspective first. So this packet that I printed out for you guys, the seller's seller agent's seven step survival guide for multiple offer situations. So um, this kind of jumps into timing for listing your property, right? Because we've talked a lot about there's a, there's a psychology between when you list your property, as far as what day of the week to go active, what you're going to do for showings, how you're going to handle showings, whether you're going to, the verbiage you're going to put in your description about multiple offers or, or, you know, presenting all offers on this day. And then like we've talked about before, there's a strategy for pricing the property, right? So one thing I would keep in mind too, with yours, Chad, is there's three pricing strategies for pricing a home, right? As a listing agent. Hi, Hi how are you? Good. You want to grab one of each packets yes. up here? Um, so there's three different pricing strategies for pricing a property. And as we all know, the market speaks to us, right? The market activity, the number of um, showings that we get scheduled. So the first pricing strategy, and this is important to think about in this market in particular, because you guys should be having this conversation with your sellers every time you list a property. The first pricing strategy is based on comps and it's kind of going with the highest, the highest possible list price based on what the CMAs and the comps look like in the market for this property, right? So we're going to kind of shoot for the moon, you know, comps, homes are selling for 350 in this neighborhood. So we're going to go for 350 or maybe even 360 because they sold really fast with multiple offers and you have more features, right? More benefits in your property. So you go for the top of the market, the highest possible price you can try to get for them. The second price strategy is middle of the road, right? So you look at the range that you were going to suggest and you, they go for the middle of the road, safe, stable, probably will get at the top of the range. It might sit for a little bit longer. You might get less off, fewer offers and less chances to get a bidding war or escalations, right? The middle of the road it might sell a little bit faster. You might get a couple of offers, right? Maybe some escalations, but it's it's pretty solid. I know this is the range we're talking about. This is dead center. I feel like it will move pretty quickly at this middle of the road range. The other option is the bottom, the bottom of your price range. So you go in low. And I think they talk about it in here. And this is so create an auction, number four, an auction-like effect. So many people will get caught up in the frenzy and pay a higher price as a result. So 
this auction like effect, or I call it a feeding frenzy, right? If you think about what happens when you throw a piece of meat into a pool of piranhas, that's what this low pricing it really low as to the comps, what the effect is of that type of a pricing strategy in this market. So um, you typically, it'll go really fast. It's gonna drive a ton of showings, probably going to drive multiple offers with escalation clauses, and it's gonna bid up and, and probably sell for over what you went in and listed it at, at that low price range, right? Is it risky? Yeah, could it backfire? Yes, but so could listing it at the top of the price range. That can backfire too. And we end up with a property that's sitting on the market for a couple of weeks. We end up doing price reductions. Buyers start to wonder what's wrong with it, right? So both of those two alternatives are risky. And it's going to come down to this honest, quite honestly, the seller's personality type. It's literally going to different personality types will go with different pricing strategies. Your S's and your C's are gonna go with middle of the road, safe, this sounds good, I feel comfortable with this. Um, I'm, you know, The other two sound very risky. I'm not sure I feel good about that. Your D's are gonna be like, yep, feeding frenzy all day long. How low can we go, right? And how fast is it gonna go? Um, and then your eyes will be one or the other. They're either gonna to wanna to go for the highest because they're gonna want, they want their house to sell for the most, the highest that any of them have sold on the block. It's the best house, it's my house. Um, or they're gonna go for the D, the, the fun of the bidding war and the escalations and all of that. So you'll notice, pay attention to the personality types of sellers that you're talking to. And when you have this conversation, you're gonna kind of be able to gauge where you think they're going to go with it. Some S's and C's will go to the bottom range and they'll say, yeah, well, let's, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Um, but for the most part, they'll go with the middle of the road, the, the safe and stable price option. But those are your three pricing strategies. So depending on where you choose or where the sellers choose to price it in that range is going to determine how much activity you're gonna have on the property and how quickly, really. Um, so this one, number one, starts with taking your time. What I wanna point out about this is two things. Take your time in preparing it and getting it ready for the market and making it active. And then take your time in accepting or reviewing offers with the sellers. So both of those options. I've seen agents put a property on the market on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and they get their first offer the first day or the second day. And what's in that first offer? If you're that first offer on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and you're that buyer's agent, what are you making sure that you're writing into your offer? Starts with an E is on every milk jug that you put in your refrigerator. An expiration date. Yeah, they're putting in there this offer to expire at uh, five o'clock PM on Thursday evening, right? Why? They don't want it to be on the market over the weekend. Exactly. Exactly. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush. If you like my offer, you're going to accept it now instead of wait. And if you don't accept it, I don't want my buyers tied up all weekend long. We're going to get back out and look at other properties. Um, but you need to make a decision by this date and time. They're going to try to put some pressure on the sellers to try to get their offer accepted first. But if you have that much interest or if you have multiple showings, and you know you have activity. I mean, usually when you go into coming soon status and you have it going active on a certain day, you usually have a pretty good idea of how much activity you're going to have on that property the first weekend, right? Those of you that have had listings in the office, you know you've seen how much activity. Carolyn, yours went, did it go coming soon? Yeah. It did coming soon a week before it went on the market just to get it out there. Right. And you had calls. You had verbal people telling you, you, you they were sending offers already before it even went active. You had, well, I think before it even went active, I think you had like 17 showings scheduled. Yeah, or more. Yeah, we ended up days with 61 out. showings and 11 yeah. offers. In three days. Wow. It, it went active crazy. what? Friday morning? Thursday. 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 Okay. Thursday, we took it, it was four days. Thursday morning, and we took it off at five o'clock Sunday. Yeah. Did, yeah, back to back to back. And yeah. how many offers? 11. 11 offers and, and over 60. It was, yeah. it was good. It yeah, was beautiful. It was nice. Yeah. It was, and it was very, it was beautiful. Um, so how would you price? So, well, I'm, 
I'm kind of middle of the road as Tina knows. But <laughs> so my my main thing in this market is that I want to let my clients know, the sellers, that we I would I feel better pricing if that I know the house could appraise for that. Mm -hmm. And then if it gets into a bidding war, which this did, then we are looking for the people to the buyers to forgive the appraisal contingency. Um, that I feel very confident with the comps that we ran that, that we're good here if we don't get that. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, then it's going to be on the buyers. Um, that's just what I'm comfortable with. Now, if they want to push it, that's fine. You know, I mean, I do whatever they want, but that's kind of how I go into it because in this particular case, the house, the houses were expensive anyway. And there was just, we didn't really have comps for anything over 800 and the 775 for what they had was right in the market. It was higher than some. It was a, we were right in there. And then it just escalated and it ended up selling for 839. But then that they, they forgave the appraisal contingency. Yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's what we were doing. So yeah. that's just what we were comfortable with. But um, and that's kind of the philosophy I try to do anyway. Um, I do get, I am that person, as Tina knows, I don't want to put it out there where I feel like unless the seller wants to hire. Then and then fight an appraisal, right? And and it does sit longer, not so much in this market, maybe because mm -hmm. you're still going to get buyers. But in a regular market, you're still you're going it might sit a little longer. And I am fearful of that discounted price because it might not get up to where you think you could get it. Right. And then the other thing that Tina had said years ago that I've always done, and I explained to my sellers, if after that first week to ten days, we don't have a lot of showings, we don't have any mm -hmm. offers price adjustment before that second weekend because if yeah. we're not getting it there's a problem and I it would I don't like all those days on the market yeah I mean it just yeah. scares me when you start getting those days on market so for that second weekend so we have that conversation before it goes on the market so in 10 days if we don't have anything then we're going to look at that second weekend because also then I get to boost it out there again mm -hmm. because we drop the price you know it's going to go back out to everybody right so I yeah. just don't like it to sit um, yeah. Even in a regular market, that would be my strategy to, to do that. Right. So yeah. Ask you a quick question, but like a situation where it sits more than a couple of days, would you do a second open house as well? Like you? If they wanted, it's it's interesting because some buy. I mean, some sellers don't want open houses, and then some don't mind. And I would absolutely would do one that like a second weekend if they wanted to, um, just to try to generate. Because to me, and not bigger. But to me, an open house is there to generate the interest, right? To get the people in. And we had an open house scheduled for that one um, that went under contract for me a few weeks ago. But we had so many scheduled people come in. My buyers were out of town. I mean, my sellers, I'm sorry. My sellers were out of town. So I called them and I said, it doesn't make sense to me at this point. This was on Friday night because we already all had offers coming in to block out those hours when it might just be neighbors or people driving by that aren't serious buyers well, we can have serious buyers coming in with agents. And we did. I mean, we did it all day. So we didn't do it then. But I wouldn't be opposed to doing an open house, and especially to if the price changed. I mean, I just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I wouldn't be opposed to doing it. But I have worked with people who didn't want open houses for whatever reason. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong. In that type of situation, if you're going for the second week, I would definitely do an open house um, both weeks, first mm -hmm. of all. But the second reason yeah. would be, that one, you're getting those buyers that are coming in without agents, also. Mm -hmm. So it's a chance for you at the same time to create one to get a buyer. For them. Yep. Have agents, right? Yeah. Um, and then it also gives you the opportunity to combat, you know, why has it been on the market for X amount of days? Right. Well, this is the reason where we had somebody back out or financial mm -hmm. issues, whatever the case may be, you can, you know, have that conversation. Right. right. And it, you know, takes away from some of the, you know, doubts. Yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, and every, every seller will have a different, like, you know, like you said, the sellers, some sellers just don't want open houses at all. Some only want one. They don't want a second one. Um, it's going to, but yes, I mean, I strongly recommend to you guys as agents, whether you do it as the listing agent on your own listing, or you open it up to another agent in the office and for newer agents, to do open houses, to, to hold, especially in this market, because it's such a tremendous opportunity for you, one, to door knock and market yourself the week before, 
and I'll talk about why, but then also to try to pick up potential buyers, unrepresented buyers at the open house, they're free leads. So I'm always surprised when I see agents put open house opportunities up in our Facebook group and nobody takes the opportunity to do it. Nobody jumps on there. Um, it's such a tremendous opportunity for free buyer leads or very, I mean, it, it's costing you your time. There's really no other cost to an open house um, unless you have some snacks that you put out. But the opportunity to market yourself the week before, in particular for the listing agent or for the agent that's holding the open house, in door knocking. So the reason why you door knock the neighborhood the week before is to pick up what? What kind of leads? Okay. Seller leads, yeah, thank you, listing leads. So how many times have you as an, as an agent who's listed properties, listed a house in a neighborhood and you put the sign, the sign goes up in the front yard and a week later, what happens down the street? Another one pops up, right? Or right across the street, one pops up a week later. Was there an opportunity possibly for you to get your foot in that door and to hold a listing, do a listing presentation and pick up that listing? Absolutely. But agents, so when we go back to take your time, when we're talking about taking your time, take your time in preparing it for the market. Take your time in getting all of your ducks in a row and getting it listed properly. But take your time in giving yourself the ability to have time to market your open house, which is again, why when we go back to the day of the week that you make it active on, you know, and other agents may have philosophies behind going active on a Monday or a Tuesday. Honestly, my opinion and our, rec our kind of recommendation in the office is that you wait to go active until a Thursday or a Friday and you're holding an open house. You have an open house planned for that Saturday morning. You block showings. So you block showings during your open house so that other agents aren't scheduling showings during the open house. Um, some agents are holding back-to-back -back open houses on Saturday and Sunday. Um, and then that whole week, once your photos are live and you're ready, hopefully the week before you got all your photos done, you can go coming soon on Monday. And so you're coming soon for the week that goes active on Thursday or Friday morning. And then that whole week before you're out door knocking in the neighborhood, passing out private invitations to the neighbors. This is your chance. Pick your neighbor. Do you have friends that want to be in the neighborhood? Come on out. We're holding a neighbors only exclusive open from 9 to 10 a.m. It's opening to the general public from 10 to 1. So come out before Gen Pop, right? Get your private exclusive viewing of the property. But it gives you the only reason that you're going to do that is it gives you a reason to knock. It gives you something to give to them, right? You're going to create your open house flyer invitation, whatever. But your reason and then your script when you're knocking their door is, Mr. Sanzio, and so I wanted to invite you out to the neighbors only exclusive open from nine to 10. If you have any friends that are looking to move into the neighborhood, it's going to, I feel like it's gonna have a lot of energy and a lot of interest. We already have over 40 showings lined up for the weekend. This one's going to sell very quickly. Um, and what's going to happen Mr. Homeowner, is we're going to have a whole lot of buyers looking for a house and we can only pick one, right? We can only pick one buyer offer. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a lot of upset, unhappy buyers that are still in the market looking for a house. What I would ask you is in the neighborhood among your neighbors, who do you feel I should be having a conversation with that might be thinking about selling, or maybe they've mentioned that they're, they're considering selling sometime in the near future. Um, that I should be talking to about listing their home because we're gonna have so many buyer leads left over, right? Did I ask you, are you thinking about selling? Have you thought about selling your home in the near future? No, because then as soon as I say that, what's your response? Nope, we're happy, we're good, thanks. Appreciate your time, um, you know, thanks for the flyer. No, but if, if depending on your personality type, if you're a D or an I, or even if you're an S or C and you just wanna help out, Depending on your personality type, you're thinking, right? You're, we, as soon as I say, who in the neighborhood, who out of your neighbors should I be having a conversation with that's thinking about selling in the near future? What is your mind doing? Instead of shutting down and blocking me out, your wheels just started turning, right? You're thinking about, oh, 
Who do I know? You know what? The guy down the street, that guy, his name is Andrew. He, his kids are all gone. He's, they're empty nesting. They've been talking about wanting to move to the beach for a couple of years now. I know that they're probably getting close. I would have a conversation with him. Or you. Just or you. Right, now. right, exactly. Like or they're going to say, the right, exactly. Or they're going to say, actually, it's funny you ask. We're thinking about moving, right? We've been talking about it. We're looking to move to Florida. Now, could you also canvas a neighborhood where you see a coming soon by another realtor? So you can't knock that door. No, not that door. But, but the other, other yeah, yeah, yeah. Door knock that neighborhood. So, you don't so it's not your same listing. Same listing right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, let me let me show you how. So his question was, should you could you also canvas and door knock a neighborhood where you see a coming soon sign listed? So obviously not that property because then you'd be going behind the sign, right? We can't do that. But yes, if you see a coming soon and you know it just went up and it's getting ready to go active soon, same script works, right? So, you know, this Could one, you, say, you know, I think they might be asking, you know, that other realtor, I think they might be asking a 6% commission. I'd be happy to work something out with you. I would save that for your listing presentation. I wouldn't say that at the door. I would, when you go in and do the listing presentation, but I would also, I wouldn't lead with discounting yourself. I would stick and hold your commission, hold your worth. Um, I mean, I think you, if you can sell yourself on all of the other um, assets, all the other things you're going to do to market and sell the property um, before you ever touch commission. Yeah. My personal opinion, but I would wait for them to have that conversation. Before you bring it up. And, you know, yeah. You want that 6%. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'm going to do everything I can to get it. And mm -hmm. they give some pushback and they're like, well, you know, so-and-so I talked to, you know, they got 5.5, whatever it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know what? I, we can actually, you know, we can match that. Right. As a matter of fact, you know what? Let me go ahead and do this for you. Why don't we do 5.2 or something like that? Yeah. You know, just slightly going down. Versus right. Versus cutting. cutting yourself down. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. You know, five Before they that. ask. Some people are doing that. And, and so we have so many, we have a flood yeah. of people who are discounting themselves. And therefore, everybody is now discounted. It's the same yeah. thing with the appraisals, you know, that are high. And selling your home for high or some crazy keep driving it up. At the same yeah. time, these discounted, you know, realtors, they're creating less money for all of them. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And just to say one thing, was that even if somebody approached me to my house like that, was that offer me something before I even ask? My thing is you're trying too hard. Yeah. <laughs> there you like, go. That gives me a lot. Why, why are you discounting? Right. Yeah. 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 I would fight for your commission. Um and then, and go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah. was just going to say one thing you had mentioned before that I found very helpful with listings, especially now when it's so competitive, is virtual staging for people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, as the agent, the yep. listing agent, we can't um, right. offer to do to pay for staging because right. it's thousands of dollars. Right. But virtual staging for a few hundred dollars, yeah. you can really do a great job virtually. And then I eat that. But that's just, they're like, really? It looks nice. And I show them examples. And they're like, oh my gosh, you would never know. And when I put it in the MLS, I'll put the picture of the empty room that the photographer took and then put the room virtually staged so they could see. And I put in there that this is virtually staged. Right. But, right. you know, so they know. But then they, they can at least get an idea of what the room might look like instead of just mm -hmm. an empty room. And I did one recently, and I think for, I don't remember, 15 pictures or something, it was like $300. I mean, yeah. it's not that expensive. And I got to pick out, you know, I want a pool table in that room, and I want yeah. birds in that room. <laughs> so it was really yeah. kind of great. I mean, they did, they, I didn't do it. They did it. The right. company did it. But to offer that, um, a lot of people don't offer that. And they'll say, well, mm -hmm. you should have um, staging. And then the seller thinks, well, that's going to cost me $3,000, $4,000. Yeah. So they like that option right. and that might set you apart too. Yep. Yeah, no, I like that option and I agree. And so that was kind of the next um, item on here is launch your full marketing plan. So a lot of agents kind of are thinking, well, it's going to sell so fast and there's going to be so many showings and the house speaks for itself. Why do I need to spend money on, you know, the, the HD 1080 pixel photography and hiring the professional photographer and all of these things. So, and this goes kind of ties in Terry with your, your comment or your question about commission and discounting your commission it 
you want to always present yourself as the consummate professional, right? So what sets you apart? What do you do to establish your level of professionalism? And if you start discounting the services because the market's it's going to sell so fast and that we're probably wanting, well, that goes back to taking your time, right? Taking your time to set up your listing, to get your professional photography, your, your virtual tour, if you're going to do virtual staging, all of those things, but make sure that you're not discounting what you're doing to prepare the property for the market um, and still do all of the things that you would normally do. Because then as soon as if you start discounting your services because it's got, and you build that, well, Mr. Seller, it's going to sell so quick and it's going to go fast and easy and, and multiple offers. And now as a seller, I'm thinking, oh, so you're, you're going to just, you know, you're not going to do professional photography because it's going to sell so fast. Well, why am I paying you the normal commission? Why am I not paying a discounted commission? Right. And then it starts to build this. Um, you're setting yourself up for. Leading into that, yeah, exactly, exactly. And not only that too, then I think it becomes part of your reputation mm -hmm. because regardless if the house is a two hundred fifty thousand dollars house or seven hundred fifty thousand dollars house, you're going to provide the marketing, you're going to provide the professional photos, you're going to provide the video, right? And people know that and they appreciate right. it, you know? yeah. And that you're going to do the nice brochures and yeah. I just think that's all part of it. And, yes. And yeah, they get the whole package and they're thinking, wow, you know, that is great. Right. And now the virtual staging that's out there, it's, it's, and yeah, it's, yeah, that's helped. But you know, I think doing the whole package and now too, even with multiple offers mm -hmm. that who's going to sit down and go through all of the, you know, just, yeah. you, know, you can really put that whole package together for them that they're getting good value for their money. Right. You know, yep. they're, it's not cheap, but they're getting a lot. Right. Exactly. I would also say as a protection, just because of what I've been through, um, let's just say, you know, and I've done it to where the, the sellers have paid for the for the pictures, and I've done it to where I paid for the pictures. Mm -hmm. But I would almost put, you know, something for them, whatever, that states that you know I will provide pictures and whatnot. You know, provided that you sell for some reason, you know, you decide that you know you're just not into it. Yeah, like a cancellation market, fee. Then you know, you yeah, know, will be reimbursed for the amount of money that you spent. Right. Yeah. So you can do that, and we're starting to see that. Um, we're starting to see that a good bit in listing agreements. And um, what he's talking about is kind of a cancellation fee that if you, if I list your property and we might, and I do all this preparation to market it and you end up deciding not to sell it during the listing term, in your termination, you would have a fee that they have to pay to reimburse you for the costs or the expenses. Um, a couple things there. I mean, I would make sure one that your termination time period in your listing agreement is 30 days or more. Chad, you had this experience. You had one that um, they terminated the listing agreement with you before it even went active on the market or the day it was supposed to go active on the market. And he had paid for advertising for an open house. He had done the photography, paid for the photography, the signpost installation, and the sign went up and it went coming soon. And of course, who pops up? some friend of theirs who happens to be an agent or whatever, right? And says, what are you doing? We, what do you mean you're selling your house? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you talk to me? He had door knocked to them. Well, they terminated, but his termination paragraph didn't have, it said like terminate immediately or 24 hours from written notice or something like that at that time. This was a couple years ago. Yeah. So it would have terminated right before his open house and everything was supposed to hit. So now it's 30 days minimum, 30 day termination, you know, agreement to terminate 30 days from receipt of written notice by either party. Yeah. So that you now have another 30 days to continue to market and advertise it. Can they make it difficult? Yeah. Can they say, well, we're not, they can decline showings. They can make it really difficult. Um, but also putting in their termination fee that if they terminate the listing agreement, um, and decide not to sell that they owe the brokerage because they can't owe you directly, right? But it would come to you, the brokerage, a reimbursement fee of whatever it is to reimburse for expenses paid out in marketing the property. Um, so you can do that. The other thing, um, so the other thing to keep in mind is because, and this is what um, somebody came in and was talking to me about this morning, they had a seller, they put the house on the market paid for all the 
good photography. It, it was a high, high price point listing. Um, did all of the marketing things, signpost installation, everything. Went, it went active the first weekend, multiple offers. And between that time, during that time, the seller's been looking around and trying to look at properties that they're interested in looking at. Now, all of a sudden, they're panicked and they're thinking, well, actually, we might change our mind. We might decide we don't want to sell at all because we're not sure where we're going to go once we sell. Part of that conversation to them can be, and it depends on it depends on how you think this is going to go. And I mean, we can never coerce or force somebody to sell, right? However, when do you earn your compensation as a listing agreement? I mean, as a listing agent, when is your compensation earned per the listing? What's that? That's a buyer's agent. Okay. Well, when similar. You have, well, same thing. So, well, it's different. But when you when bring, you brought a contract when somebody closing. Closing closing yes to buy the property. No. So Heather, no. Thank you for saying that because that's what most agents think that Heather said at closing. No, the listing agreement states that as a brokerage, we have earned our compensation when we present to a seller a ready, willing, and able buyer willing to purchase the property at what the seller was willing to sell it for, AKA the sales price on page one of your listing agreement. So she has two offers in hand from buyers that are ready, willing, and able. They have pre-approval letters. One of them I think is a cash offer. Has she earned, has the brokerage earned the brokerage's commission? Absolutely. So if that seller, and here's your conversation, Mr. Seller, I understand you're, you're worried. And that's part of my job is to help you navigate this, help you find the right property for you and, and help you find your next home. However, what I need to make sure that you understand is per the listing agreement, the contract that we signed and that you signed with my brokerage, because we have two offers in hand and they're offering more than what they listed it for on the MLS, they escalated. Because we have two offers in hand by ready, willing, and able buyers, let me refer you to the paragraph in the listing agreement that states that my brokerage has earned their compensation. And at this point, if you decline these offers and terminate the listing contract, you will still owe immediately upon termination the full 6% commission to my brokerage plus the 495 flat fee additionally. <laughs> Salt in an open wound. But... Settlement. So Heather, I'm glad you said settlement. Settlement per the listing agreement, settle, uh, the payment of compensation at settlement is offered as a, um, as a convenience, I think is what it says, to the seller. However, settlement shall not be a condition precedent to the payment of compensation, meaning it is not a part of, it doesn't, settlement does not have to happen mm -hmm. For us to have earned our compensation as a buyer's agent when do you earn your compensation when you find the buyer a property that fits with what they were looking for in the budget they were looking in and meets all of the spec specifications that they were looking for so and again same thing with us with a buyer settlement I is not a <laughs> She's not understanding me. Let me clarify it for her. <laughs> so again, same thing with a buyer. Settlement, I mean, condition, your compensation is earned when you show procuring cause. So that's where you procuring cause. You're the agent that was responsible for convincing the buyer or procuring a property for the buyer that they decided they wanted to move forward with and purchase, right? So um, that's why I had an agent call me the other day and they had to go, they had a buyer, they had to go out of town or they were out of town for the weekend or something and they were unavailable and the buyer wanted to see a property. And they, this agent asked me, can I call the listing agent and ask the listing, to sh the listing agent to show my buyer this property? I said, if your buyer decides to buy it, as long as you're okay with the buyer paying the compensation to that agent as procuring cause, then sure, go right ahead. And they suddenly were able to find somebody else to show the property for them, or they made it, they worked it out, right? But if, do please don't ever ask the listing agent to show the property to your client or ask your client, hey, just give the, I'm, I'm unavailable, but why don't you call the listing agent and, uh, and see if they're able to show it to you or go see it during the open house 
or mm -mm. or unless I'll listen agent is somebody with access, right? Um, you better be calling that agent even still and having a conversation to make, Hey, listen, here's the deal. I'm out of town. I I'm sending, can I send my buyer to the open house? I do have a signed buyer rep agreement. Um, I'd be, you know, I, I, I know they're interested in it. I've talked to them about it, but I'm not able to actually come and show it. Would you be okay with me sending them to the open house on a tent without me present, but just make sure you have that conversation. I mean, I wouldn't just take for granted because if they come into that if, or if the listing agent is an exit agent, exit results and that and they call and the listing agent shows the, the house and spends an hour there with your client and talks to them about it and pitch it, you know, presents it in such a way that they decide now they want it and they're interested in it. Technically, that agent is still procuring cause, regardless of whether they're in your same brokerage or not. They were the agent. If they decide they want to write an offer. Yeah. But I mean, so there's several tests that go into deciding what, who was procuring cause, but it's not just a lot of agents think, well, I sent them the listing through email. Well, that's great. Good for you. You set up an auto search alert. That doesn't mean you were procuring cause. And that's not, that doesn't, you know, there's several tests that when a case goes before the board for procuring cause against an agent, that they go through and they run through all these tests and they decide at what point they're looking for at what point the buyer decided, yes, this is the property for us. We want to make an offer on it. And so um, I don't know how we got on that tangent, but listing agents. So just talking about, you know, listings and, and cancellation fees and 30 day termination clauses. All of these things are important because sometimes what happens and when we're talking about this termination fee and the 30 day termination window, you know, sometimes what happens is the coming soon sign goes up in the front yard and these buyers have been looking in this neighborhood for six months and have made multiple offers and they're desperate now and they happen to be driving through the neighborhood and they see the coming sign pop coming soon sign pop up. What do you think they're not afraid to do now? Right. Oh, hi, Mr. Seller. Uh, we saw the sign in the yard and, and we see that you're getting ready to sell the house. Um, we we want to buy it. We're, we, a sight unseen, we don't even need to see it. We want to submit an offer. We want to buy it. And now your seller's thinking, seriously, what did I just pay Andrew for? What am I paying Andrew for, right? Maybe I can do this myself for what? For protection, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, they're thinking, you know, they're mine. They're like, well, shoot, I, I just, the buyer. Well, okay, but Andrew's the reason you just got that buyer because he put the coming soon sign in the front yard and that's what they saw. So he's procuring cause. He found you that buyer and for the listing agreement, you still owe the full compensation, but they don't understand that. And so they're calling, hey, Andrew, we hate to do this. I feel really bad about it, but we decided we're not really ready to sell yet. We, we want to terminate and maybe we'll think about it. And okay, we're going to set up a search alert and we're going to watch the status of this property so that when it changes ownership, we know exactly when it changed ownership, right? But, but that's why you have those protections built into your listing agreement too. 30 day termination, a termination fee that if they terminate, you know, and it doesn't get to settlement, that this is what it will cost you. You'll have to reimburse the brokerage this amount. Um, so okay, question. Hang on one second, Heather. Give me one minute, and then I'll come. I'll jump to you. So, with my constant travels, I've actually called listing agents and said, "My buyers really want to see this house. Are you okay with showing it?" And they said, "Sure, Terry, no problem." Yeah. And I've never had anybody come back. Yeah. But I've also been asked the same. And my feeling is that my loyalties are to the seller. Yeah. So if this is a buyer, even though they're with another agent and they want to see that house, I'm going to show it to them because right. I'm representing my seller and I want to sell it. Yeah. It. yeah. Um, and you can. Right. Right. Exactly. You can. And you know, what's the rule of thumb? The rule of thumb is it's never a problem until it's a problem and that's fine. So for, and, and that's a decision for you, a business decision as a listing agent. And I fully agree with you. So Terry's point was, 
he's asked other listing agents to show his prop his buyers their property because he's been traveling and they've always been fine with it and they've never really challenged it and in in the same respect as a listing agent he feels it's his due diligence on working on behalf of his seller to show a, a property to a buyer that's ready and willing and 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 make his property available in his representation of his seller in presenting all buyers. So, and yes, and that, so as a listing agent, if you, if you're okay with that and you want to make that decision, a couple of things that I would be sure one is, are they under buyer representation agreement? Because if they are, that's fine. You don't need to disclose anything. If they don't have a buyer representation agreement, you have to disclose an understanding whom the real estate agent represents at that scheduled face-to-face meet, -face meeting with them. So if you're showing it for another agent, then they need to send over their buyer representation agreement or whatever. Are they under buyer representation? If they're not, you have to disclose understanding whom the real estate agent represents to those buyers because they're unrepresented buyers and that you represent the sellers. Um, so just make sure that if you're doing that, you're doing it properly. Um, because a lot of buyer's agents are not getting buyer rep agreements signed when they first meet. And so you have unrepresented buyers that you're meeting with on as seller representative, and you're not disclosing understanding whom to them. But yes, but I, where I would be careful is on that flip side, because not every listing agent is going to see it the same way as you. And there's a lot of unscrupulous, greedy agents out there that will cut you off at the knees if it means that they keep an extra 3% or 2.5% on that deal and not have to pay you. So just be very careful on the flip side of that. Um, Heather, you had a question. So going back to open house, well, first, if like we have a buyer's agreement and we get offers in and then they back out and stop looking, I want to go after all those buyers and send them my bill. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, open houses, if you have a client that just goes to an open house themselves, like I can't stop them from going half the time. I don't even know they go. Like how does, right. So you can't else has, like, steal them. And remember, so remember in your buyer rep agreements, um, on page two at the top, there's a paragraph that talks specifically about open houses and new construction communities. And if they walk into a new construction community without you, or if they go to an open house that, and what their responsibility is as a buyer under your buyer representation agreement. And it's very clear in there. So when you're doing your buyer qualifications and you're presenting your buyer representation agreement, you need to be explaining to them there's certain things they're not supposed to be doing. And the reason why is because if they do this and that agent can claim procuring cause and keep the compensation, if they're under buyer representation agreement with you, they're going to be paying that commission to the brokerage, not the seller. So in that instance, they could be putting themselves at risk of having to pay several thousand dollars in compensation because either they go into a new construction community without you and they weren't pre-registered and now that broke, that builder won't honor you or they walk into an open house and they're convinced to make an offer or that agent claims procuring cause against them and now they also owe the brokerage the commission themselves. So one thing though, I think that helps sure. is that, not always, but will help is when you explain exactly what that buyer's rep agreement is yeah. for that they are being represented, that this is the law in Maryland, if you want representation. And if you don't, whenever you're looking, you are actually um, that the agent on the other side is looking for the seller. Right. And just explain what that difference is. And I've in the past had clients who have wanted to go to open houses and I'm not always available to go with them. And I've given them cards. And I said, when you go, tell them you're represented. Yeah. And you can give them my card. Right. And that way, or at least you say you're represented and they'll get my name, one or right. the other. Um, to try to avoid that exact thing, because yeah. um, especially if they are out, if they understand that they have an agreement with you and what that stands for as far as you being able to negotiate for them and mm -hmm. have their best interest and their fiduciary, then some of that might go away. Right. Yeah. Did you hear all of that? Yeah. But I, Did you have yeah, I have another question then too. Then on the flip side, if I'm hosting an open house and people are signing in that they have an agent, because a lot of people come to them that said they have agents and they, they're not there. Am I supposed to be like reaching out and targeting them all? Like sometimes I sometimes I kind of do, sometimes I just don't because I don't know. I mean, for respect, right? I guess I want respect for my if my buyers are going to an open house, I want them to not be like targeted and but here's, but. The, so here's the thing to remember, and 
so the majority of buyers that come to an open house, what, when you go, when you decide you're, you're ready to buy a new car and you're going to go shopping for cars and you walk onto a car dealership lot and a salesperson comes up to you and says, hi, are you, can I help you with something? Are you looking to buy a car? What does everybody in here say? No, thank you. I'm just looking. No, thank you. I'm just looking. What are you there to buy? A car. We just said you're going to buy a car. But when the salesperson approaches you, your automatic response is, no, thanks. I'm just looking. I don't need any help until you're ready to ask for help, right? I will tell you, 99% of buyers that come to an open house, when they're asked if they're working with an agent, what do you think they're going to automatically say? Yes, we're working with an agent. We already have somebody. Thank you. The leads that you get on the lead team. Large majority of them call and say, I want to go see this house at 123 Maple Street. Are you working with an agent? Yes, we're working with an agent. Because what does Rob teach you? They, they, it's that resistance to, they don't want to be sold to. They don't want to be attacked. They don't want to be hounded. They think, oh, if I say I'm not working with an agent, that Carolyn woman, she's going to just hound us nonstop. She's crazy. They're right. But they're going to tell you. So when, you are at an, when you're holding an open house as an agent and you're asking buyers, are you working with an agent? They're all going to, almost all of them are always going to tell you yes. Some of them will say, no, we, we're not. But, they're, but then they're probably going to back it up with, but we're not really sure we're looking yet or we're, you know, we're just thinking about it. We're not, because again, they're worried they're going to be hounded. They don't want to be hounded. They don't want to be sold to. So yes, you're still going to follow up with them. You're going to market to all of them. You're going to follow up and however, you, whatever your follow-up system is for leads that you get from an open house, I would follow up with all of them. That property, their interest in that property is your door to call or you're in when, if they've given you contact information. Hi, Mr. Butler, this is Tina Hyatt. I met you at the open house at 123 Maple Street on Saturday. Um, I was just calling. We actually don't have any offers yet on the property. It's still available. Uh, and I was just wondering, are you still interested in that property? Or would you like me to find and send you some others that might fit your needs a little bit better than that one? Right? Or my call is, hi, Mr. Butler, this is Tina Hyatt with Exit Results Realty. I met you at the open house at 123 Maple Street last weekend. I just wanted to let you know that, unfortunately for you, that one actually did go under contract. We, had, we ended up with multiple offers and we're under contract. So if, if it's something that you were interested in, I'd be happy to send over some other properties similar to that one that are still available. Um, would you like me to set you up on a search alert or send you some custom properties that I found for you? Right? right. Now, quick question. Yeah. So let's just say to alleviate some of this, you have you know, the sign on sheet, right? Mm -hmm. And the way you were, instead of saying agent yes or no, right? You know, agent name. And then yeah, the ask page. for the agent's name. That's a great idea. You know, please make sure you fill this mm -hmm. out. We need to for such and yep. such reason. Yep, to follow up with your agent after the open house if you're interested. Right. So you could ask on your open house sign-in sheet, or instead right. of saying, are you working with an agent? Ask them to actually identify their agent's name that they're working with. I mean, now, could they say, just pull a rando name that's popular in the area and say, yep, this is my agent. I got one. Sure, but but whatever. But so if they put, yeah, I mean, exactly, right? It took some effort. They're really working to lie. But I mean, if they, you know, if they, then if they don't put down an agent's name, you didn't ask them, are you working with an agent? And then they can just say, yep, we're working with an agent. You ask them for their agent's name. And then you can just say, you know, I, I'll follow up with your agent after the open house to see, check on your interests and see if you'd like to make an offer before we, if in, in the event we get multiple offers or something, whatever, right? But that's a little bit of a different question than just asking for a yes or no. I love that, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. Um, so consider restricting showings during the first week. So you can do this. I would be very careful in how you do this. This one talks about um, don't, uh, don't allow unrestricted access to the home for the first seven days. So again, this kind of goes back to our um, method of making it coming soon for the first week and then making it active on Friday, for example. 
This philosophy is a little bit different. Maybe you launch. Um, so many agents have been very successful launching listings on Thursday afternoon, restricting showings entirely on Friday and only allowing showings at open houses for three hours on Saturday and Sunday. I'm not a huge fan of that for the main reason that, first of all, our MLS agreement states that when we make a property active, we're making it available to the, to the public. We're making the property available for showings to the general public. So I have a real issue with these agents that restrict and block showings only for during the open house. There's a couple of them out there that are that have one in particular that's done this. You're going to establish a reputation for yourself among your colleagues that is not in the most professional light. Um, so I would just be very, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. What I would recommend is, sell. what's that? They always sell before the open house then too. It seems like, are they open houses like so crazy crowded is pathetic. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Then you're mobbed at the open house. But I mean, I like the other, um, the other option of restricting showings to make it coming soon on Monday, have it coming soon from Monday to Thursday, go active either Thursday or Friday, and then you're active over the weekend. And then creating an auction like effect is that multiple offers where you put in your remarks that, um, and it talks about it down here. So the options pick the best negotiation option for the seller. So one, I don't like, I don't like one. I think, I mean, A is horrible. Reject all offers and ask the buyers to resubmit. That's horrible. Um, the paragraph B says call for the highest and best. So ask all buyers agents to submit their buyers highest and best offer by a certain time frame, right? So all offers, um, we request highest and best offer all offers to be submitted by 5 p.m. on Sunday evening, seller to choose the best offer on Monday, all agents will be notified by Monday evening or whatever, but then stick to it, okay? Now that's not to say, and I'll touch on multiple offers and if offers come in after your time, your time frame and your limit, but call for the highest and best, give a certain time frame, pick the, the offer that appeals to you the most and negotiate with that one exclusively. So it's talking about the sellers, obviously. The sellers can pick the one that they like the best out of all the offers that come in and they just negotiate directly with that one. Call for highest and best and offer suggested minimums. It's a unique twist on calling for highest and best. Includes specifics about what the buyer is looking, I mean, the seller is looking for. So offers are more interesting to your seller. So what I wanna touch on about this one, and yes, I absolutely agree. First of all, in this market, sellers can pretty much pick their terms, right? Sellers can pretty much say, I want a 60 day post occupancy for free. I wanna pay nothing. And I wanna post occupy for 60 days. Uh, they can say buyer to pay all transfer and recordation taxes. They can say whatever, whatever they want, they can pick their terms, you know? Um, so, but that should be disclosed upfront. So whatever the seller is asking for or looking for, you can put it in your agent remarks in the MLS. Seller requires 60 day post occupancy at no charge or seller, um, here's another one. Seller can pick who they wanna use for their title company. Seller can say, seller requests buyers to use seller's preferred title company of results title and escrow or whatever one you like best. Bye, Chad. Um, they can put it in there. You can't require or you can't, but, but can the seller pick? Sellers can't force a buyer to use a particular lender, title company, or whatever. But does a seller have to entertain an offer from a buyer that's using a lender that they don't like or isn't using the seller's requested title company? Yeah. No, they don't have to review that offer. They don't have to accept that offer. So if the buyer wants their offer to be reviewed and more attractive to the seller, seller requests buyer to use local lender, not a large bank. What? The reason you said why some of them are asked, uh, trying to suggest the seller, I think at one of the other classes, you were kind of giving us a reason why some people do that. Yeah. So for lenders, so for example, we've had several of our, several agents have come to me and said, Hey, uh, the seller's telling my buyer that they won't accept their offer from Navy fed or from bank of America or yeah, good for them all day long because those banks, first of all, they blow settlement dates all the time, large banks, Navy fed USAA, they're horrible to work with 
horrible to work with. They work banker's hours. They don't care about your real estate contract terms and deadlines. They blow them all day long and they're, oh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, that's how it is. We'll get to settlement when we get to settlement. What? I'm dealing with that now with Navy Federal. They just don't care. You're on a pile and they won't even tell you if your pile is number one or number 10. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, online, online lenders. So some of these guaranteed rate or what's the one that uh, online, it's all online. Um, what? Rocket? Rocket mortgage, or there's a couple of them. Um, they're horrible. They're again, they're horrible. Who knows where your loan officer is really located. They might be out of state. Your underwriters and your processors are probably out of state somewhere and don't know local anything, anything local. They're picking from a randomized bank of appraisers that, you know, they might send a, an appraiser to a Howard County property that's from Cambridge, Maryland. We'll do Cambridge appraisers that live in Cambridge, no Gray Rock neighborhood, no, um, no, they don't know. They don't know school district stuff. They don't know zone. They don't know anything like that. So uh, you can absolutely. So we've had um, offers get kicked back and say, if you want your offer to be reviewed, you've got to choose one of these three lenders, or you've got to pick a local lender, a, a broker, or not a huge bank, or not use it. I don't care. Just don't use that one. You can't use that one, or the seller's not reviewing your offer. Um, and it's because the deal's not going to get done. Or if it does, maybe it'll get done in 60 or 90 days, but probably not in 30 or 40 days. Um, so having a little bit more control, making sure that the, con that the title company and the lender that they're using are trusted, vetted, you know that they're going to get the deal done, period. Um, it was like, okay, I'm sending it to, no, send it to us. We are actually controlled, you know, we're going to be doing it. So it was, it was like, your buyer? It was my buyer. So unless, so here's the other thing I want to touch on about this. If you're the listing agent, was it written in your contract? Um, it was, no, it wasn't. It was, so no, the buyer picks their own. So I would refer to the paragraph that says buyer's right to choose. And the buyer has a right to choose their own title company, settlement provider, home inspector, lender, et cetera. What I want to say on the listing side is if you're the listing agent and the sellers are requesting or requiring or whatever, buyers to use results title and escrow. Mm -hmm. You better make sure that it is written into your contract. All parties agree results title and escrow to be the settlement service provider for close for title title work and closing or whatever. You really but, should have it in the MLS also. Yes. You know that you're requesting right. the sellers requesting mm -hmm. the use of their title company. Yes. Maybe you don't need to say the name, but right. because we have that and then and they are, yeah. but it was a very specific reason that the sellers wanted to use our title company because of something that had happened before with another mm -hmm. title company that just wasn't good. So yeah. they wanted to go with this trusted title company. And yep. so when the buyer's agents would call me and say, why is it? I mean, just, I basically told them, you know, yeah. that there was an issue before and they wanted to go with the title company that they trusted. Know, I had known and that I could say, and they were all, everybody was fine with it. Yeah. I mean, everybody was fine with it. We had the rate sheet, mm -hmm. um, you know, but we did request it and it was in the MLS that we were requesting it. Then it was up to them to ask if they cared right. um, or not. But back to your side from the buyer agent side, if the seller, the seller cannot make the buyers use it. Once you have a ratified contract, if it's not written into your contract and agreed to in writing by all parties, then no, the buyer has the right to choose their own title company, lender, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I would give pushback on that. And I would I say, good, I, I, good um, for you. It was, I just called that I was like, listen, I said, um, the title company from um, the seller side just keeps emailing me. Mm -hmm. and like, what are you doing? We need this. You know, mm -hmm. you send us it. And I'm like, well, and then I'm like, this is new for me. So I'm like, having, I just need you to tell me. Yeah. Say, oh, no, we already. Yeah. We but also be very careful because there's scams going on out there where you'll, your clients or you, the agent will start to get, when you go under contract, you'll start to get emails from a title company saying, send over the information, send over. They're phishing. They may not have even, did you ask the listing agent if the sellers, if the listing agent had 
hired this other title company? I just called Kathleen. I didn't even. Right. So what I'm saying is you don't even know that the sellers were requiring or requesting that title company to be used. That's how all of these wire fraud scams start out because an agent thinks or an agent or the clients get a request for information and they send it over. They don't know any different. They don't know who it's coming from. So be very careful because the sellers may not, the listing agent may not have even, that may not even be their title company. Yeah, it could just be, huh? They have the seller's information and she sent yeah. me some documents with the information on it from the contract. And I was like, and she was requesting information from the buyer. And I said, um, no, let me call and make sure. Yeah, <laughs> good. So yeah. And no, and remember they can get that, they can get the seller's information is all on public records. Right. So even these, so these hackers and these scammers are, I'm not saying that one was, but I'm saying I've seen this because other agents will send me, have sent me emails and say, hey, this title company is, I think for those sellers and they want to do settlement and they're trying to get no. And it turns out when they call the listing agent, the listing agent had no idea who the title company was, but they can get, think about a lot of the information they can get publicly off of public records, who the sellers are, street address, all that in for the deed, they can go to MD Land Rack. They are very sophisticated and it looks extremely legit mm -hmm. when they're trying to get information from you. And sometimes they are not. They are, they are trying to find contact information for the buyers to send an email. Here's the wiring instructions for settlement. Make sure you have it wired to this account by this date in order for settlement to proceed. So just be very careful, but yes, exactly, no. And so unless it's written into your contract of sale, just because if the buyers and I've seen agents fall for, you know, oh, well, I said it, I put it in the MLS. They said that they were gonna work with our title company and we went under contract and they changed their mind and they sent it to, well, shame on you for not putting it in writing, right? Nothing verbal, just because the listing agent says in an email, buyers are willing to work with sellers title company, um, well, okay. Do you have it in writing agreed to by the buyers that they're agreeing to work with this title company? Because if you don't, that email from the listing agent, I mean, from the buyer's agent is not even worth the paper that you printed out off of. Wow. Yeah. Um, I just wired the hundred thousand to a prince in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Wasn't I supposed to do that? <laughs> yeah, totally. That's good job. Good job, Josh. Way to follow instructions. <laughs> um, put all offers into a format so where they can be easily compared by your sellers. So um, you can create a spreadsheet. I know a lot of agents will create spreadsheets where they put all the details of the offer in that spreadsheet, all of the big terms, and then kind of pull it all out to a net, a total net to the seller or whatever they think is important to that seller, all of those details into an easy to read format. Here's what I want to stress to you. Just because you're putting all of the details into a spreadsheet and you're sharing that spreadsheet with the seller and this is what we're going to review and okay, now I've selected offer five or offer letter G or however you're labeling them, whatever. Just because that's the offer that they're, they're accepting, you are required by law as an agent to submit all offers to your client, the seller, in a timely manner, okay? Notice I didn't say just the one offer that they accepted. All offers are required to be sent over to the seller in a timely manner, even if the property is under contract. So you go under contract, you accept an offer, and so once they've decided which one they want to accept, to share them all to them in dot loop, share all the offers with them in dot loop or share all of them the night, right? Like an hour before I'm going to come meet you at seven o'clock. I'm going to share all of the offers with you. However, I have it all in a very easy to understand spreadsheet or a summary letter or whatever. And I'm going to, we're going to go over that together. And if you want to ask specific questions, but I'm sending them all to you because I have to send them all to you and make sure you have all of them in hand. Okay. And then you go under contract. They pick one, it's ratified, we're under contract, we're past the as is window, we're moving to settlement. And another offer set comes in. And Andrew calls you and says, hey, Terry, I'm just sending over a backup offer. I know you're under contract, but my buyers really want to submit a backup offer. Um, so I'm sending it over to you. 
and it's $50,000 more than the highest net of the offer that you ratified and you're under contract. Are you required to share that offer with your sellers? Please say yes, because yes, you are required unless your seller in writing has waived that requirement to see and review all offers. If the seller says to you in writing, Terry, as of the date of contract acceptance on this offer, we do not want to see, we don't want you to send over any other offers to us, then you keep them in dot loop. You have to archive them. You have to keep copies of everything. So even if all of the offers were sent over to you in email format, you are required by the Real Estate Commission to archive for five years all pieces of paper in relation to that transaction, all of them. That's every single offer you received has to be archived. If you do an open house and well, let's take that out of the equation because now we have our little real estate agency sign, but you go and you show a property as the listing agent for four buyers that other listing agents, buyers agents couldn't come and meet their client there. And you said, yeah, sure, I'll meet them and I'll show them for you. And you've gotten them to sign and understanding whom the real estate agent represents. Every single one of those is supposed to be archived. So just make sure that you're paying attention to that and that you're following all of those real estate commission requirements for documentation and archival, okay? And sharing all offers with your sellers. Because say, for example, we're under contract and we have a ratified contract and this other offer comes in after we go under contract and it's for $50,000 more and it's all cash and it's no appraisal and it's as is and you know it's the holy grail of offers, right? And the buyers come back and say to you, um, I don't know, we did the as is, we did our inspections and you know, that HVAC system, it's a make or break for us. Um, we either need it replaced or we're terminating the contract. And you've shared that offer with your sellers like you're supposed to. What do you think your sellers are gonna say to them? Bye, Felicia. Uh -huh. Right? Because no, we got another golden offer sitting in backup, I don't need your offer. We don't need to replace the HVAC. If you don't like it, you take it or we're moving on. Mm -hmm. And they might, so if they move on, great. We take the backup offer, right? Mm -hmm. So, and remember things like kick out contingencies and other things like that still exist out there. Mm -hmm. The last piece on this of etiquette for multiple offers. And then I can, we can kind of talk about some of the buyers things if you guys are right on time. Let the other buyer's agents kindly know please let them know that their offer was not accepted. Don't just, you know, make it go under contract and accept the one offer and then just kind of blow off all the other agents that had submitted offers. Give them a phone call or shoot them a text or email them. Just let them know, hey, I'm really sorry. Thank you for your offer. It was awesome. However, we went with another offer. Or if there's any feedback you can give them, I'll tell you, Rob recruited Susu, an agent that's with us, he actually recruited her because she was an offer in a multiple offer scenario. She had a buyer. She was at another brokerage. She submitted an offer on one of his listings and he called her to let her know that her offer wasn't accepted, but he gave her some feedback on how to help her improve her offer in a way that might help increase her chances of getting her offers accepted. And it was things like paperwork how your paperwork was turned in, how your offer was submitted, the forms that you used, they were really outdated. And not to mention that, you know, half of them were missing. You hadn't pulled down my disclosures and the sellers were really nervous. I mean, we had stronger offers, but the sellers take all of that out of the, the equation. The sellers were really nervous to accept an offer like that, where it wasn't even submitted, you know, with the proper paperwork. So if there's anything I can do to help you with your paperwork, I, you know, my brokerage has a great class once a month. I know my broker would be fine if you wanted to come attend Achievement Academy. Monday, we talk about offers and go over the merit. I mean, Wednesday, the contract of sale, she took him up on it. She came in, he recruited her and she's, I mean, she sells typically million dollar properties. Do you think that's a pretty awesome recruit for him? She'd been in the business less than a year. She had no training, no guidance, no support, no nothing. And instead of him just saying, eh, your offer wasn't accepted or just blowing her off and ignoring her or telling her, you know what? There's no way we would have accepted your offer. It was a mess. I don't, you know, I don't know who your trainer is. 
he took time and kindness and coached her and he got a recruit out of it. A good, a very good recruit. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of, so letting the buyer's agents know, did you have a question? I just wanted to add to that and say that I had, out of, I've had a couple that gave me a little bit of information, but I had one who like went into depth yeah. and really like told me what the other offers were almost. I mean, they- Yeah, don't be that person. But yeah, like, you know, apparently it was the middle. Yeah, and I mean, we pulled out all the stops. It was yeah, yeah. Know, but we only were a thirty thousand above list. Right. You know. Yeah. Um, but we did the addendum to pay the difference and the whole nine yards. Right. Um, but she, you know, basically told me, you know, this is this is how you know futuristically, if you're going into these type of situations, that you know you can do this, that, and the other. Yeah. The paperwork was beautiful. She was like, everything that you submitted was perfect. Awesome. She was like, but. You know, and unfortunately, right now, especially in this area, yeah, you know, everyone for especially for a turnkey home, mm-hmm. it's going way above you know, X amount mm-hmm. of the other. But just the fact that she was, you know, she took the call from me and she emailed, yeah, me. she emailed everybody, you know, hey, unfortunately, awesome. we did not accept it, um, for whatever reason, right. blah, blah, blah. But then I called her acting like I didn't get the email, nice job, but she yeah. really went into it. Didn't try to recruit me or anything like that. Right. But she right. was just like very, you know, yeah. This is what happened. This is how it, you know, it is. Right. And, and that's how we should be, right? We are cooperating agents. But I'm gonna remember her as my friend. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, so exactly. When we do that for other people, yeah. You know, they're gonna want to work with us yep. in the future. Yep, exactly. You know, I go in on a home that you're listening and you're like, you know what? It was really we had a great conversation, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you kind of filled me in a little bit about what I could have done. Right. Or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? just- yeah, exactly. Just remember it. Real estate is a very, very small world. And all it takes is establishing a reputation for yourself that is either greedy, arrogant, unprofessional, whatever. And people remember that. I mean, you can ask Dennis, he knows what agents and he knows exactly what agent is pulling this game of um, 0.25% commission if the property is shown before the open house. And then when you call and try to schedule a showing before the open house, they decline them and they're not even allowing them. So they're only allowing showings during the open houses. Um, he can tell you, Dan can tell you, you probably, you maybe even know. Well, I had an experience not too long ago with, with a, a buyer and he put an offer on a house that I thought was actually was in burning. That I thought was unbelievably strong. Mm-hmm. And it was in the seller's agent was an ex exit agent. The results? Uh-huh. And our offer mm-hmm. was declined. Never heard anything. I just noticed, oh my God, it's on the contract. Mm-hmm. So I emailed him and said, hey, what can you tell me? You know, where did we go wrong? I mean, I was a nasty. I was yeah. very nice. Nothing. Not a response. Not like holding. Didn't pick up. Well, guess what? Guess what happens now when he has a buyer that wants to submit an offer on one of your listings, right? Uh-huh. What do you think? It, uh-huh. Karma. Exactly. I mean, it comes like, right so back around town. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? I yeah. So where if yeah. I have a bad experience with somebody, I'll put it on a little sticky note and I'll mm-hmm. stick it right on my wall and put it on my desk. So every time I'm on the phone, I'm always mm-hmm. looking at that wall. I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, so okay, yeah. <laughs> sure, absolutely. You know, I'll go right. ahead and let them know. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. talk about yeah, it. That's yeah. That's not right. Me and I refer. Well, and the, the <clears> thing <throat> is the buyers want to But it's a reason he's not here. Oh, oh. Well, I, just, I mean, you don't know. I want to know now. <laughs> Slip me a piece of paper. Slip me a piece of paper. It's unethical to talk bad. Yeah, but they should get back to you. That's yeah, just, it's courteous, and it's right. We're in professional business. We should be professionals about right. it. Right. And I did when I sent my email out. Just to, you know, I work with buyers too, and I know how hard this mm-hmm. market is and how disappointing yeah. this is. And you know, and then some called me, some didn't. Yeah. You know, they thanked me for the email. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Um. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And uh, it's all in ha- how you handle yourself and how you, but yes, a level of professionalism and letting them know that their offer wasn't accepted. You can't give away all know. the details. Yeah, just remember, you can't give away all of the details. So you can't 
tell somebody what it went under contract for. You can't tell somebody, well, we had an escalation that went up to 350 and yours only went to 320. You can't give those details. Um, so jumping real quick, I do wanna show you a couple of the addenda that are in here that you can use either as a listing agent or a buyer's agent. So as a buyer's agent, um, and this is where you need to know and pay attention to the MLS. And we go over the statistics at the beginning of every office meeting for this very reason. So when you're working with a buyer and a buyer says to you, well, Terry, how much over list price should we go? And if you know your statistic and you know that right now homes are selling at 111% over list price. Well, Mr. Buyer, homes right now in our market are selling in Maryland 111% on average over list price. That means some are selling for more, some are selling for less, but on average, 111% over list price. So what that would equate to is where would you like to go in at, right? But your escalation, so this is the Maryland Realtors escalation addendum. There is one, this is in the Maryland Realtors forms in dot loop. There is one in the, the exit results master folder, but it's the GCAR escalation clause addendum. This is the Maryland Realtors one. This is the one that we use most often and most of our agents are using. Um, but in here, remember part one, the buyer fills out and submits with their offer all of part one filled out. So the buyers are offering to escalate their initial offer um, by this amount. So in the event sellers receive one or more bona fide written offers, bona fide written offers, please don't as a listing agent, please do not ever, ever tell a buyer's agent, well, we have multiple offers, bring us your highest and best if you don't have multiple offers. That's misrepresentation. And you can be taken to the guarantee fund for the amount of money that it costs the buyers to come in at a higher offer amount if you did not have written offers in hand. So do not misrepresent. They were also buying those days. I mean, not the city. Right. Yeah. I mean, it depends. I, you know, the other part of that is, is you have to be honest. So if the, if the buyers that you should be asking, well, Carolyn, um, do you have those offers in hand? How many other offers do you currently have in hand in writing? She can't lie. Right. And You're so and what I was saying initially, because I had people calling, this was at house two weeks ago, saying, you know, we're going to send an offer in, we're going to send an offer in. Um, and I didn't have any in hand yet, but I felt they were coming because mm -hmm. they were asking some questions. So when other agents would call, how many offers you have in hand? I said, I don't have any in hand yet, but I should have three coming. Yes. Or I should have two coming. And then as I started getting them in, I have so many in hand yeah. that I have two more that I believe are going to be coming. Right. Which was all honest. Yep. You know, yep. so, and if I didn't have any, I mean, I didn't. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind is if they ask you if one of those offers is your own, if you represent or if you have the buyer for one of those offers, an unrepresented buyer that you wrote the offer for, you must disclose that yes, one is your own. Okay. Why? They have an upper hand possibly because you have more financially to gain from presenting your own offer from that unrepresented buyer than these other, than from these other agents. Not only that, you cannot negotiate a reduced commission on an offer for an unrepresented buyer that you've written the offer for and it's your listing. So for example, how this, how this happens is, so you get an, you have a buyer that comes in and they don't have an agent through an open house or they call to see the property and they have no agent and they say, I don't, I don't need an agent. I just want you to write it up for me, Andrew. I know you're the listing agent. I understand that, but I just want you to write up the offer for me. And the seller says to you, you bring in the offer to the seller and the seller says to you, well, you know what, since this agent, since this buyer doesn't have an agent of their own, would you be willing to negotiate a discounted commission? Do I still have to pay the full commission? You know, will you do it for 4% instead of 6% or whatever? Uh, that's called a variable rate commission. It's supposed to be only agreed to in writing at the time of listing agreement. And it is a required disclosable material fact that must be disclosed in the MLS. It says variable rate compensation, yes or no. That means that you've negotiated with the seller in writing up front that if you bring an unrepresented buyer, that you will reduce the commission by X amount. 
agents, you're required to disclose that because then again, it puts your offers for unrepresented buyers at a financial, at, they gives them a leg up, right? More beneficial to the seller to accept an offer from you with an unrepresented buyer than from Terry and have to pay out 3% buyer agent compensation to him or whatever you've agreed upon. Does that make sense? Now though, if we felt like that might happen and we wanted to put that in the listing agreement, that's where it's supposed to be. Right. But I'm saying, should we have that conversation with you first? Did make yes. sure that it's okay? To yes. That? Thank sure. you for asking. Yes. <laughs> Any commission reductions have to be approved by the broker, but yes. Did you have a question? Just an issue that, that I found. So as you know, my clients, you know, they're going to own a home. Mm -hmm. You were the only offer, good offer, very good. Um, the agent that I was dealing with um, was a broker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then so we submitted the offer, and then she was going to present what's called 11 o'clock, and this was nine o'clock. Yeah. Okay. There was no other offers. Okay. And then all of a sudden, you know, within two hours, now you have another offer that beats ours. Like, I really want to go in and look. Yeah. And I can tell you, I, can I know. Find out I sure. know. I know where you're going and with I that. Guarantee you. Yeah. That that's what happened. What yeah. we're thinking, we're exactly right. what happened. The hard part with that is, is like Milson was asking, how do you prove it? I mean, you have to have proof. So if the buyers are going to, you know, if your buyers wanted to file a complaint against that broker, um, they have to have proof. They can't just say, well, we think, or, you know, this is what we're pretty sure happened. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've even had, so going to the um, presenting all offers, right? It's in your listing or you represent the seller. It's in the listing agreement that you, your due diligence is owed to your seller. If another higher offer comes in, or if your offer is, came in and there was another agent or another buyer that was maybe interested, but they weren't quite sure. And they said, let me know if you get any other offers, right? Because this happens all the time. And that offer comes in and you call that other agent and say, hey, we got another offer. I'm presenting tonight at nine. If your buyers are still interested, it needs to be in by nine and we're making a decision by 11 and then that other offer now comes in. So it, it just happened to me. Yeah. And I was angry because I called the, I called the listing agent and I said to him, this is my buyer. Cause I said, so are how many offers you have? Know, cause they were going to do the, um, the, the seller was like, they're accepting no more offers by 2 PM. Yeah. That's it. And I had already put it in the showing, and we were going to go out to the place. But I, they really, they already looked at it mm -hmm. once in LS, and they really liked it. It was within their price range. And I called the listing agent. I was like, um, so I saw that you have a deadline, you know. So how many offers do you have? Because my buyer's really interested. And he was like, well, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be presenting the offer by two. So it, it was like 12, 12 for the Mm -hmm. And I had just found the list. Like, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. He just called me. Like, I like this part. So he didn't even decline my showing until yesterday evening. So it was like I still had a showing scheduled. And he said it, there was like five offers. Oh, I said, well, what's the asking? I mean, what's the offer price? Two hundred thousand. And I said, well, you know, do you think they'll accept? You know, offers. He said, well, if you, if you can get an offer in over that amount by the See, end. that's crazy because that's a that's an ethics violation right there. He's yeah, not supposed he to disclose how much the other did. offers he are for. If you, if you I mean, you can set a minimum, but as long as you've told everybody that same minimum. So like you could say sellers are only, you know, sellers are not taking, you know, or I wouldn't bring us your highest and best, no offers below 300000 Yeah, I just called my buyer and I told him that. I said, well, if you want to make an offer <laughs> within like 15 minutes, we can do it. The, the, right. Yeah. The agent said 200,000. So we can yeah. do it. The property was listed for 189. Uh, and he said, well, I have one old offer way over that. And the, the, listing, um, the seller, she's not um, accepting, you know, this, it's at 200. And that's just cool. two o'clock. That's just that's yeah. two o'clock. Yeah. And I mean, know. and so it, unfortunately, we can set deadlines and we can advertise a deadline, but if the seller, if an offer comes in, we have to present it to the seller. And if the seller chooses, if it's a better offer and the seller wants to take that offer, 
it's the seller's right, right? The seller has the right until they have a ratified contract, fully ratified, meaning we've signed it and we've returned it and we've given you notice that we're, we're under contract. That's why I would not as a seller, as a listing agent um, or as a buyer's agent, if the I listing agent- Like he did, you know, like Andrew was saying, I just want to know when did- Yeah, but see, it really doesn't matter because- I'm for, yeah, I mean, does it suck? Yes, but it really doesn't matter. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, okay, so another situation where I had, they had a deadline at two o'clock. Yeah, right. You know, good number. Anyway, two o'clock, and I had, you know, scheduled a showing for 10 a.m. that day, but they had, you know, yeah. offers in by such and such, right. you know, 2 p.m. Yeah. Okay. My showing was declined, and they accepted another offer and changed it in the MLS, in the MLS, yeah. says all which is fine right. again so they're anticipating you know they're hoping that they're going to get offers by 2 p.m that's creating that frenzy right and the agent probably said you know let's put in the remarks because sellers don't say that right how many sellers have said to you i want to put in our listing uh description that all offers have to be in by two o'clock for us to review sellers aren't going to say that the agents are saying that and they're trying to create that frenzy but Again, like we talked about, timing is everything. So if you went active on a Thursday and I have a buyer and I got in there and I showed it on Thursday and the buyer wants it and you and your remarks say all offers by 5 p.m. on Sunday, sellers to review offers on Monday or whatever. And I went in and showed it on Thursday and I put an expiration date in my offer for Friday at 5 p.m. because I don't want it to get to your open house and I don't want to get through all of those 60 some showings over the weekend. And it's a really great offer. And if her sellers want to look at it, she has to prevent it. She has to present it, right? Cause it's going to expire. She can't hold it until Monday. She has to present it and her sellers have to make the decision on it. If the sellers say, you know what? That looks awesome. It's everything we wanted do it we then we don't have to deal with all this chaos and all this do it we want to accept it can they absolutely absolutely even with a time even with a limit that says so the sellers are still in complete control of when they review and when they accept so she might say all offers by 5 p.m but the sellers may have said to her we want to review every single one when it comes in as it comes in we don't want to wait and review all 17 of them on Monday. We want to review every one. We want you to, can you give us a summary sheet of every one as it comes in, when it comes in? And if one comes in that we like, we'll cut it off and we'll say, we'll go with that one. They can do that. It's their prerogative. So yeah, does it suck? Yes. Here's what I would say though, as a buyer's agent, to ensure your buyers the best possible chances of getting their offers in and reviewed. A couple things you want to be doing. One, as soon as you start working with buyers, you should have a contract, an offer template put together in Dotloop with their name, all the brokerage information, all the details, their loan type, everything. All you need to fill in is a street address, a settlement date, and a purchase price, right? Because that's all we really need to know is what property, how much are we offering, and when are we going to end up closing, depending on when we finally submit an offer. But you can have your offer paper. So if 1243, they want to see it, and I can get you in at one o'clock, and offers are due at two o'clock, and they decide at one o'clock they want to write an offer, I'm pulling my laptop out at the kitchen table or in the back of my car, and we're sitting there, and I'm filling in the details. You're signing the offer, and we're getting it in by 1159, 59 p.m. for that two o'clock deadline, right? Um, but the other part of that is, is the other lesson to learn from this is don't wait. If you can get them in earlier to show the property, just because there's a deadline of 5 p.m. or 2 p.m. on Sunday, I wouldn't be waiting until 10 a.m. on Sunday. If you can get them in there on Friday night or Friday or Saturday morning or any earlier, the earlier you can get them in, the better. And just to add to that, so a question I had for you, Tina, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was approached by another agent. He knew we would probably get multiple offers because he had listed a home and not far from where this one was the week before and had a ton of showings and offers and things. And he wanted to know the whole philosophy about the cutoff time and would I accept contracts after the cutoff time. So I called Tina, you know, because ethically, you feel like, yeah, you have to, you mm -hmm. have to present it to your buyers. And 
So the, the the thing he kept saying, and that Tina reminded me of that I learned and forgotten, was that um, you can't call the of uh, the the buyer's agent, or you shouldn't ever call the buyer's agent verbally and say mm -hmm. we've got a deal. They just picked yours when it hasn't been signed, yeah. actually ratified and sent over. Because that's when the next offer comes in after the deadline, mm -hmm. but it's an amazing offer and you're required to show it to your sellers. And then they're like, wow, this one's better. But yeah. I called the other agent, it doesn't matter. It's not in writing. So yeah. wait, and I had forgotten about that. Which yeah. I was glad that she reminded me, she reminded me because in that situation, what I ended up doing, because I didn't want these offers to keep coming in, we had to have a cutoff sometime. Mm -hmm. And so we, I Stop took the house off the market, temporarily mm -hmm. off the market while we reviewed all the offers. No one could get in to see it. We weren't yeah. accepting anything else. And then when it went back on the market, it went on as pending. Right. Because the contract then was ratified. It was signed yeah. and I could call people. So, yeah. And that's a great point. So as a, whether you're the listing agent or the buyer's agent, please, you should not ever be telling your client or the other agent, the buyer's agent, if you're the buyer's agent, don't ever tell your buyer, oh, they're accepting your offer. It's accepted. I'm just waiting on the paperwork to come over. Please don't do that. Because then what? No, I'm just. I just heard what you say. I'm just like, when they do that? And yeah, right. Agents do. They get so excited and they've written five offers for these poor buyers and they want to share this good news. They want to celebrate and they, but it's not a, it's not done until it's done. And even then, once it's signed and ratified, don't, what is about Brian Buffini says, don't fall in love with it until we're at the settlement table and the last piece of paper has been signed. That's when you can fall in love with the home. That's when you start calling it a home. Up until that point, it's the house. It's a house, right? Because you can't fall in love until it's a done deal because you never know what's going to happen. Um, so, so I always put expiration dates on my yeah. offers, mm -hmm. always. Now, in, this, in that situation where, let's say, we're reviewing all offers Monday and we put in our offer on Thursday mm -hmm. and we have Friday noon cutoff. Yeah. About four hours to think about it. And the agent comes back and says, well, we're presenting all offers on Monday. Okay. Well then our, my buy your buyers either have to be willing to pull their offer. Right. They have to be willing to hold firm to that expiration date. Right. But if they say they're not, then, then you have to say, all right, well, the buyers would be willing to wait right. for a so decision. No way I can force that seller's agent, the listing agent, to present that offer before noon on Friday. You can't force it, but what you can say is, well, then the offer's off the table. As of noon, the buyers have made it perfectly clear the offer is no longer a valid offer past noon today. And if that's the case, though, with an expiration date as the uh, listing agent, I should be showing it to my seller. Yeah. Because there is yes. an expiration date. And yes. And determine whether they want to accept it. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. But that is right. Exactly yeah. I mean, doing. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Do but, you know for, but, but two, but that listing agent could call the sellers and say, Mr. Seller, I have an offer in hand. It expires at noon today. They're basically trying to force our hand to accept it before right. we go into the weekend and hopefully get multiple offers. I have to present it to you. I'm going to email it over to you. What would you like to do? Do you want to, do you want to review it and accept it? And they're going to probably say, well, what are the terms? How strong is it? And they might say, well, do you think we might get better ones? Or do you think we're going to get multiple offers? And if you say, I think we're going to get multiple offers. I've had agents say we're, we're presenting offers or we're, I mean, we're going to send over an offer. We just want to see it on Saturday or whatever. They might say, you know what? Then tell them to kiss my, you know what? I don't want, I don't care. I'm not. Same with the buyer's agent though. So you were asking Millicent, well, how do you know that they have multiple offers in hand or that they got another offer? So Brian Buffini teaches a script and Daryl uses it and, and he prepares his buyers to be prepared to use this. Now in this market, if an agent says we have multiple offers, you're pretty much going to take their word that they have multiple offers because they probably do. In a regular normal market, what that script looked like and what Daryl would prime his buyers for. And this came from Brian Buffini out of our training classes is when he calls, cause there's one brokerage and one team, they're not a brokerage, but they're a team in particular where every single time in a normal market where houses sit for like weeks or a month or two months, no matter what, it's been on the market for 56 days. We have an offer we're sending over. 
oh, fantastic, Carolyn. Well, we actually have another offer coming over as well, or we have multiple offers in hand. Please make sure you send us your highest and best. And you're like, it's been on the market for 56 days. And now all of a sudden you have multiple offers. They lie. They, they, it's the script that they're taught to say, I'm not saying thou shalt not speak badly about other realtors. Um, don't stop saying names, Andrew. So in a normal market, when this team will say this, Daryl's and or any agent, any team, and they, he thinks they're bluffing, he'll call their bluff. And his response will be, oh, well, I appreciate you letting me know that. No problem. My buyers have actually decided they're really not interested in competing and, and being in that kind of a bidding war situation. So they're going to withdraw their offer in the event that that other offer or those other offers don't work and the sellers would like to see my client's offer, please let me know and we'll see if they're still interested in the property at that time. He calls their bluff. He said, now not this market. I don't want you guys to go around trying to call bluffs because they're not bluffs right now. But in a normal market, he'll try to, and he said seven out of 10 times, they'll say, oh, well, you know what? I don't actually have one in hand yet, but an agent called and requested disclosures. And I think it's coming over, mm, right? That's a different story, huh? That's not because I told him we had a showing. Yeah. He was like, well, the deadline is that, you know, I said my buyer is really interested. But I didn't want to just... Right. Right. I mean, I just think that. I mean, but some of these you have to, to, yeah. If your buyer wants to, yeah. To see the house first. Yeah. They, yeah. 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 The and then there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, if they can't get there, I mean, there's another agent that Heather was asking me. She had buyers that she was on one side of town, and these buyers wanted to go see a property that was all the way like down in Southern Maryland or something. And she could, and then the agent said, this was at like three o'clock, I don't know, on a Sunday. And the agent said, well, the deadline for offers is six o'clock. And she couldn't physically get down there to show this person this house. They didn't even have a pre-approval letter in her hands yet. And she's trying to figure out how to make this work. And I said, well, don't waste your time. That's when you tell the buyer, Mr. Buyer, I'm sorry, this one's, they have multiple offers in hand already. You don't even have a pre-approval from a lender yet. I can't, they're, we, they're not, we can't go see the property without a pre-approval letter in hand and you being able, willing and able to make an offer before the 6 p.m. deadline. Now, if they don't accept one of those offers and it's still active on the market tomorrow, then sure, we can go take a look, but we still need a pre-approval letter, which is where I was going to go next. So queuing up your offer and all of your paperwork, getting it ready is key. It's going to help you with these time frames that end up being, you know, hours or minutes that you have to get an offer in. Pre-approval letters. They have to have a pre-approval letter to make an offer. Now I know the lead team is going to be different and you're going to have leads that come in that want to see properties and they don't have pre-approval letters. But however, you know, and I would talk to let Rob coach you through how he wants you to handle leads that come in without a pre-approval letter on a property that has a deadline of an offer in like an hour. You know, he may want you to go meet them there and show it just to build the rapport and establish a relationship with that buyer if you're able to, if you're able to get the appointment. But outside of lead team leads um, or online leads or, or whatever, pre-approval letters, they have to have a pre-approval letter. You, sh you know, in this market, they're not, you're not going to be able to spend an offer on a new property that goes active if they're not pre-approved by a lender. Um, and so that's going to be key. Some of the other things you want to do before submitting an offer for your buyers, you should be always calling the listing agent if you can get them, if you can get a hold of them, and asking, what do your sellers need? What do the sellers need? What would help them? Right? Because they might not be looking for a shorter settlement. You might be thinking, we're going to put in there a 25 day settlement or a 30 day settlement. And the sellers are thinking, no, we wanted like 60 days because we need to find a house. They might want a, a rent back for free. They might need, a, you know, you don't know. Can you say though, with a rent back for free? The, the reason I'm asking that is that, so we were getting the offers in and we, we needed a rent back. So mm -hmm. people were offering free rent backs. Mm -hmm. So another agent asked me, well, what do they want? And I said, well, they need your rent back. But I didn't say we already had offers with free rent backs because I didn't think I should. But right. I did, you know, it was in the MLS and I, you know, repeated, they need a rent back. And he said, okay, well, you know, well, that'll be, it'll just be the principal and interest on the thing. And I, That's where what you could say is, 
Um, okay. So Carolyn, the only thing I'll say to you is I hear you make sure that that's part of your client's highest and best offer. Is that the highest and best that your client is willing to offer as far as the rent back? Okay. Cause I did say to them, or that they're not paying market. any rent back. Yeah, and, they're, and they're, it's free. Them, well, yeah. you know, this is a very competitive market Yeah, and they're getting lots of different things right. in their offers yeah. without and he's like, okay, well, we can we can do the rent back. We'll just charge them what it is. But, and I just right. felt like I could. And he may not even know. I mean, he yeah. may not know. I mean, that's one area where you could say, if the sellers are asking for free rent, the sellers can ask for free rent back, okay. right? They can ask for it. And especially if they have somebody else that's willing to pay it, sellers can say, you know, we need a 60 day rent back for free at no charge to the sellers. I feel like that's information you can give out. Yeah. Especially now you're not going to say we have other, offers that are giving free rent back mm -hmm. but you can say the sellers are requiring for 60 day rent back at no charge mm -hmm. okay. yeah you and can say that to you to take the actual highest and best yeah so let's talk about the escalation for a second because i want to make sure you guys understand how the escalation works so in the escalation clause addendum the buyer fills in here first of all that the buyer irrevocably agrees to increase the purchase price by the amount necessary to permit the seller to realize net proceeds that are blank dollars greater than the net proceeds seller would obtain by acceptance of such other offers provided in the provided the purchase price does not exceed blank dollars. So how this breaks down, first of all, this is an irrevocable unilateral offering by the buyers to the sellers. So in their offer, they're offering to increase the purchase price and escalate it by this amount, by an amount that permits the seller to realize net proceeds. This is what I need you guys to understand. Notice it doesn't say listing or sales price. It says net proceeds. Does everybody in here understand the difference between a sales price and net proceeds to a seller? If you don't, so the difference is just because I want to make sure everybody understands it. So net proceeds that are in say it's $5,000 increments. So this escalation is going to bid up in $5,000 increments. So net proceeds that are $5,000 greater than the net proceeds seller would obtain by acceptance of such other offers provided the purchase price does not exceed. And this is your cap. So we're going to escalate. This is like your bidding war, right? You're, oh, 5,000, no 10,000, no mine's 1,000, whatever. Up to this cap. So $5,000 increments up to this purchase price. This is where we're capping it. We're capping it at $350,000, okay? And then they fill in here, you know, how it's going to work. So the escalation causes an increase in the purchase price. Um, the buy either the loan amount will remain the same and buyer's going to pay the extra cash at settlement, or the loan amount shall automatically increase to be 80% of the purchase price or 95% of the purchase price or whatever their loan product is, right? Or the loan amount shall not exceed blank and the buyer shall pay any amount of the increase above that loan amount, okay? But the way that this works is, so say we have two offers in hand, right? And one offer is for $315,000 with a $1,000 escalation up to $330,000. And the buyers are offering to pay all transfer and recordation taxes for the sellers, okay? $315,000, $1,000 increment escalations up to $350,000. Buyers are paying all transfer and recordations. The other offer comes in at $320,000 with a $5,000 escalation clause up to $352,000, period. Which offer is higher? Which offer has the higher net to the sellers? Now, I know I'm asking you to guesstimate, but which offer has the higher net yeah. The first one. Why? Because of the transfer tax. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So the other one does not have that. Okay. Transfer and recordation taxes. They both had escalation, but only yep. have that. So this one escalated up to 352, right? Which is purchase price. 
This one capped at 350. So they both now become bidding. They both escalate each other all the way up to the cap, right? This one escalates to 350 purchase price. This one escalates to 352 purchase price, $2,000 above this one. However, this one offered to pay the seller's half of transfer and recordation taxes, assuming that they're on one and a half percent or 2%. That's one and a half percent of 350,000 is at least $3,500, 3542, whatever it is. I don't know. So now this 350, the net to the sellers, whatever it is. So you have to do net sheets on every one of your offers. And the net sheets, you can find it in Bright MLS or if title company, if your title company has a, an online net sheet, but all of the terms go into the net sheet. That's why it says net proceeds to the seller greater than the net proceeds of the other by 5,000 or whatever your increment is more than the other offer. So because this one capped at 352, when you do the net proceeds, these net proceeds are actually going to be higher than these net proceeds, even though the sales price was higher, okay? That's what I need you guys to make sure you put in lock in your minds, proceeds, net proceeds higher. Josh, I know you get that. Um, so Josh is a lender also. So he does loans. So he under, you know, he sees all these things all the time. So that's, what's important is you actually do the net sheet in bright MLS or whatever tool you'd like to use. And you put in all the terms, the sellers pay off their mortgage payoff. Even the settlement date, can the settlement date change net proceeds to a seller? Sure. Yeah, right? It could be tax prorations change based on when, if the taxes are prepaid or unpaid. It could be, um, it could be anything from mortgage payments and reducing their payoff amount based on when it's being, when it's closing. Free rent back changes it. So if one, if they're both, say they were both exactly the same, but this one's charging principal and interest for a 60 day rent back. And this one offered free rent back. Both escalations are to the same exact amount. Your proceeds on this one just dropped because they're charging principal and interest. The other one is not. So that principal and interest charge that they have to pay for their rent back just changed their, their proceeds, their net proceeds. So all of those little things, here's another one for you. Everything being exactly the same, all terms, escalations to exactly the same amount, $350,000 cap, right? Everybody's splitting transfer and recs equally. One's a VA buyer, one's an FHA buyer. What am I looking for you on this one in net proceeds? In the contract, what does the seller have to pay for, for a termite VA buyer? Inspection. Termite inspection, sure. it's $150. Does that $150 termite inspection that the seller has to pay for the VA buyer versus the FHA buyer change their net proceeds? Sure. Yeah, it could be as tiny as $150, but because they have to pay for the termite inspection for the buyers on a VA loan, just the simple loan type of loan that the buyer is getting just changed our net proceeds, okay? those little tiny details. So in here, so it states, so in the event seller shall elect to sell the property to this buyer, seller shall execute the offer and addenda thereto as submitted by buyer, attached to this addendum written evidence of the offer which seller desires to accept in the form of a proceeds net sheet signed by the seller containing an analysis of the net proceeds from the other offer. Notice it doesn't say send over page one or a copy of the other offer with things blacked out. Two net proceed sheets, one from the other offer that escalated it up and one from this offer with the escalation in there signed or initialed by the seller, which is basically the seller saying, yes, this is true and we're not lying and making this up, right? And then the seller completes part two. So notice that part two says, what is this by the seller? A counter offer by the seller. So when it escalates up and it goes back to the buyer, it's now a counter offer to the buyer. 
So it doesn't just get ratified. The seller can't just sign and accept and sign the escalation. And it's a fully accepted, executed contract. As soon as the seller kicks in the escalation and signs it, it goes back to the buyer as a counter offer. And once that happens, then they don't, you can't accept any other offers. That's it. This is just one they, unless they say that we don't agree with it. Not true. So remember, a seller, just like a buyer. So if a buyer submits an offer and then a buyer finds another property that they want to make an offer on, can they make another offer on that other property, first of all, while this offer is still dangling out there? As long as it's not signed and ratified. Yes, but what do they have to do before they can make an, if, unless, so two oh, ways. Yes. So a buyer, yes, a buyer can submit, because I've had a couple agents ask me this recently. Can buyers submit multiple offers on different properties at the same time? So can I just kind of throw it out there and see what sticks, right? Throw out four offers, see which one gets accepted. The answer is yes, a buyer can, as long as they're financially able and willing to purchase all four properties if all four offers get accepted and ratified. And all four offers must be submitted with different escrow deposits put out there. So what I'm saying is you cannot submit four offers on four different properties for a buyer, the same pre-approval letter saying that they're pre-approved up to 350,000 and make a copy of their escrow check, check number one, two, three, and submit check number one, two, three on four different offers with the same pre-approval letter. Because if all four offers get accepted, you've just mishandled escrow funds and you've opened yourself up to criminal charges. Okay. And this is why one agent is no longer with us because this happened several years ago. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> it might be, I don't know. <laughs> Own escrow pledged, yes. And if they're submitting all of those offers, you better make sure that the lender has said, yes, they're pre-approved up to that amount for four, and they can purchase four different properties all at the same time. Josh, you have a question. Sorry, I see your hand raised. I do. Um Sorry, I unmuted you. My bad. I mean, I muted you. No problem. Um, my question was, when you get into the escalation situation, uh, have you ever, is there room for dishonesty by the seller's agent in accepting an offer that they could easily fudge a net proceeds worksheet and have a seller initial to get the price driven up higher? Yeah. I mean, can they, yeah. Can anybody lie? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, people can lie. They're not, you're not supposed to, it's a violation of your ethics, our code of ethics. However, mm -hmm. can it happen? Yes. But here's what also can happen. And here's, if this is the case, if you know, first of all, that you have a buyer's offer that escalated up to 350 and they're willing to pay up to 350 and you have another offer that's escalated up to 320 or whatever. And the sellers, what can the sellers do? For that other that 350 offer instead of fudging and, and signing a fake net sheet just call and counter offer just say hey terry i got your offer thanks so much i saw your escalation listen the sellers want to counter and they just want to counter with 350. they want to take out the escalation they don't want to deal with the escalation stuff they just want to counter your offer at 350. would your what would your buyers be willing to just pay 350 for the property right and now Terry, Terry's buyers have a decision to make. Yeah, we want the, I don't care, whatever. We want the house. We just, we're done with this. We're tired of making offers. Yes, we'll, we'll pay 350. And you ratify at 350. Take out the escalation clause addendum because you didn't escalate it. You countered, change page one of the contract to 350. Here's our new purchase price. You can still counter. I think agents have forgotten that back in the day, right? Like, two years ago, we used to counter <laughs> offers. Like we didn't escalate. We just countered and said, thanks for your offer. But the sellers would like to counter with this. So you can still just counter, but can an agent, another agent from another brokerage, not within our amazing office and culture do that and lie? Yeah, they could. And maybe, maybe they do. Now, um, the question I have is on the other side, this is what I was actually trying to get into was that if, let's just say the seller has countered. Yeah. 
Now, on the seller side. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you asked. So yes, they can. So a seller can still, but they have to. So going back to the multi, you're, you're, you want to make another offer. You want to rescind your offer. The sellers can rescind their counter offer in writing at any time up until the buyers have accepted it. I mean, signed it. Signed it. And, but they're supposed to have delivered it back. So if the seller, remember, contract acceptance constitutes signing and delivery of the signed offer. So up until the sellers receive that signed offer back, the contract technically hasn't been delivered. It hasn't been fully executed, signed and delivered back to the sellers. The sellers in writing or buyers in writing can withdraw or rescind an offer or a counter offer at any time up until it's been signed and accepted. That's why the, the saying time kills all deals. The longer you have an offer hanging out there, the higher the likelihood is of a buyer getting cold feet, changing their mind, finding another property that they like better and they wanna submit an offer on. So that's where be very careful with playing games as a listing agent as far as multiple, you know, trying, oh, well, we got an offer on Friday morning, but or Thursday, and there was a time frame and there was an expiration, but we're going to play our cards and, and we're going to wait it out and see what happens and hope to get better offers. Well, in the meantime, his, his, his offer ex expired. They found another one. They submitted an offer. It got ratified on Saturday. They're locked. They're gone. And guess what? Oops. You don't get multiple offers over the weekend. You don't get any offers over the weekend, right? What if they counter three offers? You cannot. So that you cannot okay. do. They cannot counter because because they they only have a, from a seller's perspective, it's different. Buyers can make three offers if they're willing and able to purchase all three properties financially at the same time. Sellers cannot make three counter offers because they only have one house to sell. So if all three of those buyers accepted and ratified the contract, what are you doing? You just pledged one house to three different buyers. And that, that was a good thing because that was my question. So yeah, words, no. in that case, I was so, thinking in my head just because how does that play out? Yeah. If they're able to do that, then it would be, no. okay, you emailed me. And it, no, it so it has nothing to do with time. It had, no. Or so is it when the, the, the agent presents it, to the sellers or is it when so the seller just do so the sellers should not ever counter in writing three buyers offers in writing okay. notice a verbal counter is that is that legally binding and enforceable in a court of law in maryland no so if the sellers want to counter, they can give a verbal counter to all of the buyers. You could give, you could send out a mass email to all the buyer's agents, 17 offers or however many you had, a verbal counter from the sellers. Sellers are verbally countering your offer or the sellers, well, you can't put it in an email because now it becomes a written counter, possibly. <laughs> so call, 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 five buyers. Hey, the sellers would like to um, counter and see if your buyer's would be willing to come in, take out the escalation clause, 350. They have multiple offers, they're countering at 350. If your buyers are interested, change the contract page one, send it over and I'll present it to the sellers. If all five change their contracts and send it over, will the buyer, the, then the seller just gets to pick. Well, I don't want USAA, I don't want Navy Fed, I don't want Rocket Mortgage, I want to pick my own title company and I like this one because I like their, I like their, Oh, that lender's name is so pretty. I like that name. They're in control, right? But if it's in, you cannot counter in writing. Thanks, Terry. See ya. Um, I know I got to get ready. I got to wrap up too. But um, they cannot counter in writing multiple offers because if they all get signed and ratified and sent back, they've now pledged to sell one house to three different buyers and you can't do that. So if they're going to counter in writing, then they can only counter one offer in writing, um, but they can verbally counter and say, Carolyn, you know, are your, would your buyers just be willing to take out the escalation and go up to 350, take out the principal and interest on the rent back? If they are, send it back over with those terms and the sellers will sign it. This might be a stupid question, but like on the escalation clause, if you were, um, would you include like a home warranty? Um, so I mean, no, well, I mean, it? Because if this is, 
Right, so it's showing like I'm willing to do this and you know, this is just as a buyer to. So the home warranty doesn't affect the sellers at all. Okay. Financial, fin I mean, unless a buyer is asking for the sellers to provide and pay for a one-year home warranty, then that reduces their net proceeds. Right. You know, like the seller was willing to pay for it. Yeah, so that it. really wouldn't, it does, I mean, the sellers don't have to because it's right. it's a seller's market. So and the buyers. If they offer it to, and then the buyer says, okay, well, don't pay for it, you know. So right. I mean, you could. I mean, if the sellers were offering to pay for a one-year home warranty and the buyer said, you know, we're going to wait, we don't need the home warranty or we're not going to take the home warranty, then technically that's now a $450 or $500 net increase on that offer to that seller versus this offer that says, great, thanks, we'll take the home warranty. So that, that financially, the net sheet doesn't go on the yeah, it would be in the net sheet. sheet, but I mean, you would write it in the contract. Yeah. Sellers, you know, I mean, buyers, you just wouldn't put it in the contract, but the, the listing agent knows when I'm looking at different offers, this buyer wants a one-year home warranty. That's a $500 expense. This buyer does not want one. So that's a $500 increase in proceeds to the seller. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. It's just like it's part of the gift to your buyer. You're saying, hey, I'm going to purchase your home warranty. Yeah. So would that be in? So usually home, I mean, home warranties are an option for a buyer to take advantage of if they want to. They're not automatically in the contract in any way. So really home warranties right now in this market, if a buyer wants a home warranty to cover, so if they go in as is, for example, with inspections and the inspector says, well, this HVAC system is really old and outdated, I'd probably recommend, you know, prepare for replacing it in the near future. And a buyer's freaking out or they're upset, and the agent's going, the buyer's agent's going to recommend to them. Well, I would recommend for peace of mind, why don't you purchase a one-year home warranty? Um, it's about $500. It'll it'll hopefully maybe cover you for some repairs or a replacement, possibly, if this goes up in the near future. But I wouldn't just jump in and say, Well, I'll pay for it for you. I'll buy it for it. Mm -mm. Buyers, if they want a home warranty, they should pay for it for themselves. Um, I just heard some of them say that they actually get this. Some agents do. It's part of how they, yeah. yeah, just remember, I mean, when you offer some, so just keep in mind, when you start to do something, when you offer to pay for something, or you offer a discount, or technically, legally, you're supposed to do that and offer it to every single client across the board. Otherwise, if you pick and choose who I'm going to, Melissa, I'll pay for a home warranty for you as your closing gift. I'm not going to do it for you. I will do it for you. Why? First of all, how did I pick who I was going to pay for it for and who I wasn't going to? And why? If I, you open yourself up to discrimination, whether because so, okay, Carolyn's buying a $150,000 house and my commission is going to be $3,500, you're buying a $600,000 house and my commission is going to be $18,000. I'll buy it for you and mm -hmm. I'm not going to buy it for her. That's discrimination, plain and simple. Just because my commission is bigger on the house that you're buying, you're financially more able. That's discrimination. And I better be prepared to explain why I didn't buy one for Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Same with if you offer something, if you offer, if you offer, you know, if you put it on Facebook and you say, you know, I'm offering to buy a free home warranty for any buyer that buys a home with me in 2022, or uh, you can't, it has to be offered to everybody equally and fairly. You can't say anybody that buys a house with me for $400,000 or more, I'm going to provide a one year, I'm going to pay for a one year home warranty. Well, I just discriminated against every person that's not financially able to purchase a house over 400,000 in purchase price. So be very careful. So do it verbally. I mean, but but just be just be careful because if if and when something comes up and you get you get a complaint gets filed against you to the real estate commission. When they come in and they start digging, they are going to look at everything. So they're going to go in and they're going to look at every closing disclosure that you paid for a home warranty on. And if they see a pattern, boom, you're done. It's discrimination. So if they see a pattern, same with be very careful about, I warn agents about doing professional photography or some agents have said, well, I'll do staging. I'll pay for staging, but only if the, the house is over 600,000 in purchase price. 
be very careful. You're treading on thin ice by doing that because when that can of worms gets opened up and you get taken before the real estate commission for what, it, because remember you're building, ideally we teach you to build your business based on what? Referrals, that you're building a book of business that you're working your database, your sphere of influence based on referrals, right? And Andrew, you help me. I, you sell me a house. I love it. It's great. We, you know, I buy a $600,000 house. You're awesome. You buy me a one-year home warranty as my closing gift and you know, you, whatever, I don't know, whatever, or you discount the commission and you give me a buyer credit back on, on my commission because I'm buying such a big house and whatever. And then what do I do? I love your service. It was awesome. And you've told me you work by referral, right? Hey, your referral is the greatest compliment I can receive. And I work by referral. And if you know somebody that's thinking about buying or selling, and so what do I do? And I love you. And I go out and I start talking and I'm like, you got to use my realtor. He's awesome. He'll give, you know, he bought me a one-year home warranty for my closing gift. And he gave me a credit back on my commission and you've got to use them. And then Rodney, you call him. And, and now, but well, I mean, now what have you started, right? We talked to Terry about it, about discounting yourself. It's the snowball effect or this ripple effect. So you've created this status, the standard of care, the standard of business that you've given to me, I've told Rodney, Rodney, this is what he's going to do for you. And he'll, he'll give you a free home warranty for you. And Rodney calls you and Rodney wants to buy a $300,000 property. And you say to Rodney, okay, great. No problem. I'll help you out. Sure. And then Rodney, you get under contract and Rodney's like, Hey, listen, so Tina had mentioned that um, for all your clients, you buy them a free one-year home warranty. Oh, well, unfortunately that's only for clients that how are you, what, right? Or Tina mentioned that, you know, you gave, you give a buyer credit on the commission back. Um, and so that you gave her a, a quarter of a percent buyer credit back to put towards her closing costs. And so I'd like to take advantage of that too. And, and then what, what are you going to say? You tell them no, because Right, exactly. You've either just dug yourself in a hole that now you can't dig yourself out of for all these referrals in this database that you're building. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen to agents. They gave a discount to this client. This client referred them to everybody. Now, every buyer that's coming to them through referral wants that same discount. And now you've just, now you've just discounted and all those clients, you've, you've lost all that income. Or you say, no, I'm sorry, I can't. That's only for purchases above a certain purchase price. Well, now I've just committed discrimination. So be very, very, very careful in how you, what you do, who you do it for. And um, yeah. And now I haven't done things like that. I would say you take that one person that you may have done something a little extra for. Hey, honestly, I don't want to have ever done this right, before. Right, right. Make them feel special. So please, send yeah. them referrals, please. Right. But don't let them know how, you know, how much I did for you. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, special. I mean, you could you could try that. But then, you know, depending on who that client <laughs> is, right. they're going to, it they is risky. Yeah. They don't like the top. Right, right. Then they're like, or they're going to be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> he says he doesn't do it for everybody, but I'll tell you, if you haggle with him, he will discount his commission. You just have to, you have to barter with him. You have to really haggle, but you can beat him up and he'll reduce his commission. He says he won't, but he will. No, I'm just saying that's what happens. That's how that happens. And that's, it's, it's a slippery slope. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So I think that's 215. I got Closing uh, like, cost gifts. I got. I got to run, guys. Hopefully, this was helpful. Um, what I would normally do is I'll do like a gift basket.